Do you ever drive by those perfect homes? You know, those brick homes with immaculately trimmed foliage and curved walkways leading to their grand entrances. Maybe you even live in one. The perfect neighborhood to raise your kids. Safe, secure, the kind of neighborhood with immaculate Christmas displays every year that people like me love to take their kids and drive through in awe. But how could a neighborhood like this become the scene of a gruesome double murder? Hi, true crime fans. You're tuning into Coffee, Murder, and Mystery, a true crime podcast where we discuss murder, mystery, and the supernatural. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Melissa Lancaster, and I have a special guest here with me today. My daughter-in-law is here with me. Say hi, Lexi. Hello. Now, Lexi has never been on a podcast before. This is her first time. Also, she really doesn't know very much about the story that we're talking about at all. So have some patience with her. I did want to tell you guys that I'm going to start putting out episodes bi-weekly until the end of summer. I've just realized my summer schedule is a lot busier than I thought it was in the winter, and I'm just not able to make a weekly schedule. But hopefully in like October, it's possibly going to be November because I really love Halloween and hay rides. But definitely by November, we'll be back to weekly. But for this week's episode, we're taking you to Texas to discuss the Wamsley family. The Wamsley family seem like the perfect family. Rick was an accountant who also did work for oil companies in Houston. Suzanne Wamsley, who we're going to refer to as Susie, has studied art at Oklahoma Christian College. The couple met in high school, and Susie was a beauty. Rick was an athlete. A few years after they graduated, they married. It was 1978, and their first child was quick to follow. Baby Sarah was born on Valentine's Day. And just when things couldn't sound any more perfect, the couple's second child came into the world. Andrew Wamsley was born in 1984. The couple nourished their picture-perfect life. Rick enjoyed working in the yard. He did projects, like for instance, there was a beautiful flagstone patio and tiered fountain in the backyard of the couple's $1.6 million estate. Rick had built the patio and fountain himself. Wow, that is very expensive. Right? I mean, can you imagine living in a house like that? I thought my apartment was expensive. And Susie had a beauty that people described as not diminishing over the years. It's said that her beautiful red hair was often the topic of conversation. Like, everyone wanted to know how they could get her look. Susie had hobbies and liked antiques. She set up a booth at a local antique mall to sell like little treasures she would find, but she didn't do it for too long. She was a super dedicated mother, the kind of mother that would show up at like her children's activities, camera in tow, rooting for them to do their best. She would often also take Andrew fishing, just wanting to spend time with her kids, just be involved in whatever they liked to do. Rick and Susie didn't just love their families. They loved their friends as well. If there was an emergency, they were the kind of people that you could call to come help. If one of your family members passed away, they would be at your door to offer comfort, food, and companionship. It seemed like Rick and Susie ran a fun household. She would make multiple dishes for dinner so that no one was forced to eat a dinner that they didn't like. And she would often bake Andrew's favorite brownies for him. And when his friends were over for gaming, she would make sure that they had their pizza. Sounds like a normal family to me. It does sound pretty normal, except, I mean, 
I don't know. There has been times where I've made like multiple dishes for people in my household, but a lot of times I also just kind of force them to eat what I make. So I don't know. It seems like she had more time than me for sure. Yeah. And in true perfect homemaker style, Susie was on point with her Christmas decor. The inside and outside of the house were known to be gorgeously decorated. The bushes and trees were lit with strands of multicolored lights. And there was even a sleigh like in the middle of the front yard that was just it, beautifully aglow. But it, it seems like Susie and Rick also had high expectations for their children. They were known to be strict and it seems like they wanted the best for them. They were trying to teach their children to work hard and make good decisions in life and get the payoff like they did. But in November, something strange happened. Rick, Susie, and Sarah were driving along North I-35. They exited the freeway to have lunch at a Chili's when they heard a huge boom. They pulled into the restaurant parking lot to inspect their vehicle, and they found a bullet hole in the rear left panel of their Jeep. I wonder who did that. Well, they called the police and made a report, but there were no witnesses and really no information. So it seemed like it might have been random, except Rick thought that he might have saw a white Mustang drive by. It just so happened that their son Andrew drove a white Mustang. But there's a lot of white Mustangs out there. And so it was decided at the time that this was probably just random. A random drive-by shooting. It seemed like the couple and their daughter were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Rick and Susie tried to make the best lives for their children and to raise their children to be the best to their potential. But everything at home wasn't sunshine and roses. Which I don't think like anything in anyone's home is always sunshine and roses. Like normal family situations. Right. I mean, every family has them. I I just don't think that there's any perfect family out there. The Whamsies didn't always live in the beautiful Walnut Estates neighborhood. Rick and Susie had worked hard to move away from their mediocre life. They started in an apartment in Arlington and later moved into a nice but, you know, like normal home. But Rick's success grew, and they made a beautiful life for themselves in this beautiful million-dollar estate. I personally think that this is probably why it was so important to Rick and Susie that Andrew and Sarah make great choices and great lives for themselves. They had worked so hard to, you know, have that life for their children. Just something normal that parents like to do for their kids. Right. But they really did it to, like, the extreme. I mean, because a lot of parents, they like to do that for their kids. They want to make, like, a great life. But, I mean, these people were really doing it, right? Like, 1.6 million. But as anyone who has teenagers knows, you can guide them, but you can't force them to do whatever you want. That would be so nice if we could, but we can't can't like force your life upon them free will you know we all have it (laughs) andrew had befriended a group of kids who hung out at a local ihop in high school a lot of people used to head to the local applebee's and just use that as their hangout spot oh like after school yeah You know, we never did that when I was young. It seems so weird to me. But I guess these kids were just hanging out at this IHOP for like hours every evening. They were playing like games, playing with Yu-Gi-Oh cards and playing like a few different games. I know a lot of them would just sit at the Applebee's with their friends and kind of just hang out. And they wouldn't really order anything, but they would just sit down and hang out and talk with their friends and... I'm surprised they didn't really get kicked out. Maybe they ordered a drink here and there or something. They frequented this establishment so much that they also, like, befriended the staff. One of the kids in this group that Andrew was friends with was named Chelsea Richardson. And they fell for each other and started a relationship. But Chelsea didn't have the same kind of upbringing as Andrew. Chelsea lived a modest life with her mother 
in a nearby city. Chelsea thought that Andrew was a catch. I mean, he was smart, driven. I mean, his parents had money. He drove a Mustang. And he was attending a community college, so it seemed like he had a future ahead of him. And Andrew was comfortable with Chelsea, who came from this modest life and didn't expect much from him, you know, like his family seemed to do. But Andrew's parents did not support their relationship. They wanted better for Andrew, and it seems to me like they felt their little prince was just too good for Chelsea. And Sarah seemed to have problems with her parents as well. Some sources say that Sarah may have suffered from a bit of mental illness and that at times may have required hospitalization. One of Sarah's co-workers even said that she had tried to swallow a handful of pills at one point and it looks like she got a DUI and you know when she was being pulled over from the DUI it seems like she ran her car into a fence trying to flee from police. Wow. So some sources say that there were signs that Sarah was depressed and had possibly undergone some emotional abuse. But Sarah actually came out later and said that the allegations of her suffering emotional abuse were false. And even if Sarah did suffer from depression and have to undergo some hospitalizations, I feel like that is more normal nowadays, more common where... You know, people undergo this, they go through these hospitalizations basically just to get regulated on a medication. You know, it takes sometimes up to a few weeks, maybe even a month to get regulated on a medication, you know, that will help you. So I don't really think that there's anything really strange about that or odd. I think it's actually becoming pretty normal. Yeah, I agree. But Sarah was also known to party and date older men, and her parents were not thrilled with this behavior. Even kicking her out of the house just a few weeks before she graduated high school. That's awful. I mean, it does seem like she is just kind of exhibiting some normal teenage behavior. Yeah. And that does seem, you know, rather... It's a normal teenage thing. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, we're not in this situation. I mean, you know. You never know what goes on in other people's homes. Yeah, it's hard to know what people are dealing with, you know. But kicking her out didn't really help matters because she moved in with a man, an older man named Todd. And she ended up getting pregnant, and she was only 19. And that definitely did not fare well with her parents. Sarah and Todd did get married, and they tried to have a life together. But unfortunately, as so often happens, it didn't last long, and they did end up getting divorced. They ended up in a big custody battle. Todd actually won custody of their daughter, and Susie felt that Sarah was not just a disappointment, but an embarrassment to their family. I would have been embarrassed to even call that my family if you can't really support me during my weakest moments. Right. And I was 19 when I had my first pregnancy. Me as well. Yeah, Lexi was 19 when she got pregnant. And her and my son were together for years and years and years. But, you know, none of the parents were thrilled at first, but... It was still a supportive system in that matter. Yeah, I mean, we eventually all came around and realized, you know, we had to be supportive and... And things just happen. Yeah, and my my granddaughter's sleeping in the other room. And we don't really know how long it may have taken the Wamsleys to warm up to the idea of Sarah having the baby. Because they do know that, you know, they did babysit and things like that. So I don't think that there was any... Anybody cutting anybody out of their lives or anything like that. But here's where the story starts to get a little bit sticky. On December 10th, 2003, a good friend and neighbor had spent time at the family's home. And everything seemed to be normal. The house was immaculately decorated for Christmas. And Susie was just living life happily like she normally would. But a 911 call came in on December 11th, 2003 at 11.40 p.m. 
And this call was really ominous because no one said anything on the line. It was just dead air. Police were still dispatched to the home. The officers looked around and looked in the windows and knocked on the door. There was no answer. The house was just quiet and still, like you would probably expect most of the houses in Walnut's estates to be at that time of night, that time of year. But the officers noticed that the garage door was open and the door leading into the house was unlocked. So they went in. Nothing would prepare them for the blood trail that they saw and followed. When the officers saw the horrible scene in the living room, Susie Wamsley, blood covered and deceased on the couch, and Rick, blood covered, face down, and deceased in a pool of his own blood by the front door. These officers immediately left the house as they should, and they called their department's crime scene investigators. The crime scene investigators found that Susie was murdered first. She was lying peacefully on the couch in a t-shirt and underwear and didn't appear to have struggled. This is why it seems like she was killed by the gunshot wound she suffered to the head. Even though it appeared that the gunshot wound had killed Susie, her attackers still stabbed her repeatedly in the chest. And as most of you listeners probably know, this makes murder seem very personal. This lets the police know that it's personal. Someone is angry. They weren't just being robbed. You know, it wasn't just something random. You know, this person was filled with rage. Rick, on the other hand, he fought for his life. But police found multiple shoe prints at the scene and knew that there was more than one assailant. Rick didn't have a chance. Police found bullet holes in the walls of Rick's room above his bed. And it was clear that the fight for Rick's life started while he was in bed that night. Rick was shot twice. They believed he was shot in the head while laying in his bed and was able to get up and run. How is that even possible? Sometimes it is. Sometimes people even survive gunshot wounds to the head. But it's amazing to think about because you would just assume that you're going to die. I mean... It's just how awful. It's crazy to think of somebody, you know, getting up and running after that. But his assailants shot him a second time in the back. And that caused Rick to go down. The crime scene investigators stated Rick was still fighting for his life, trying to get up after the second gunshot. There was a blood pattern on the floor resembling a snow angel. Rick finally was able to get back up and he ran toward the front door, but Rick didn't make it. Things all over the house were in disarray from the struggle of his assailants trying to stop him. Luckily, during the struggle, a barrette was knocked out of the hair of one of the murderers. So it was a woman. Yes, and Rick was also holding a handful of hair that was not the same color as his own. He must have really fought. It it sounds like he did. Now, police knew robbery was not the motive because they found just under $15,000 in the couple's dresser drawers. Police didn't know why the money was just sitting in the couple's drawers. Some suspect that because Susie was on the couch, Rick was in the bed, maybe she was planning on leaving him. This seems to be something that was suggested by a neighbor. Um, I feel like I don't want to speculate too much on their marital problems. Everybody has marital problems. Maybe she was saving for something. Maybe they just got into a simple couple fight that night. Oh, I mean, that's definitely true. Those things could have totally happened. But regardless, the money wasn't missing, right? They found it there. The assailants didn't take it. So this was definitely not a robbery. But the neighborhood was definitely shocked. I mean, they didn't expect something like this to happen in Walnut Estates. But you guys know what I always say. You know, evil people are everywhere. 
but police started looking into the murders and they found out about the couple's car being shot at just a month earlier. Remember when they were on their way to lunch? That made this murder that already didn't seem random seem even less random. They were able to take the bullet recovered from the drive-by shooting and match it to the bullets at the scene of the murder. So someone was really out for that family. It seems like it. Susie was shot twice in the head and stabbed 18 times, while Rick was shot once in the head, once in the back, and stabbed 21 times. There was a knife blade that was recovered at the scene where, I mean, I guess they took the handle with them. Knives often break when somebody is repeatedly stabbing somebody really angrily because bone will break the blade off of a knife. And, I mean, clearly there was a lot, a lot of stabbing going on here. So they did find the blade, but they did not find the handle to the knife. Detectives immediately start questioning everyone, including Andrew and Sarah, but they were both able to tell investigators where they had been and what they were doing. Andrew and Chelsea had camping plans that were canceled because of the weather, so instead they hung out at one of those sports places that has like golf carts and batting cages, and they played mini golf. They also hung out at Chelsea's house. Sarah had picked up her daughter from Rick and Susie the day before. They were babysitting her. She hung out with her parents, played some games. It seemed like they weren't currently maybe having any issues. You know, they were trying. And then the next day when the murders occurred, she hung out with a co-worker and the co-worker stayed the night. Detectives got a subpoena and took DNA samples from everyone. They took DNA from the kids, I believe Todd and Chelsea, and Chelsea's roommate, Susanna. When detectives went to Chelsea's house, where Andrew spent a lot of his time, they said it was disgusting. They were shocked that Andrew was spending his time there. Cockroaches were everywhere. And an investigator opened a drawer to look for, like, a knife handle without a blade on it. And, I mean, then they didn't find it, but they said cockroaches just scurried out everywhere. That's gross. It definitely is. Detectives also thought it was really gross. And, but detectives really got their big break in the case when they received the DNA evidence results. The hair that Rick Wamsley was holding in his hand matched the DNA of Suzanne Toliano, who was the roommate of Andrew's girlfriend, Chelsea. Oh, yeah, that's surprising. Yeah, so this is when it comes out that Andrew and his Waffle House friends had concocted a scheme to murder his parents for insurance money. Murdered just for insurance money? While Rick and Susie had a $1 million insurance policy, and they they had left everything to their children. So were the parents not willing to help out their kids if they were in need? I think that they were. Um, I know that Sarah, you know, she had originally lost her custody battle, and Todd had, you know, gotten custody of their daughter, But she was going through a new custody battle where she was trying to get custody of her daughter. And her parents were basically funding that. So I feel like they were willing to help out their kids. You know, maybe with some discretion, as most parents do. I mean, you don't want to help out your kids just to do anything. I mean, that was a $1.6 million estate and a $1 million insurance policy plus all of their belongings in the house. I mean, that was a lot of money involved in that. Not enough to kill your parents for. I mean, is there anything that's enough to kill your parents for? Absolutely not. Eventually, money just runs out, and what are you going to do after that? You're going to live with the guilt? Yeah. The kids had obtained the gun that they used in the murders 
from a manager at the Waffle House. They had originally planned to kill the whole family, Sarah included, by shooting the gas tank of the car that day in November. They expected the car to explode. I thought maybe they expected the car to turn out into like a, another car and get oh, into a get crash into accident. and then kills them all. I feel like detectives got super lucky because the only reason police got the subpoena for Susanna's DNA was because she was Chelsea's roommate and her hair was also dyed like Chelsea's. Also, remember that 911 call where it was just dead air, no one said anything? Chelsea and Andrew were waiting for police to find the bodies because they thought this like insurance payoff was going to be like kind of instant. So when police did not find the bodies right away, they started to get worried. So they actually returned to the crime scene, went in, and Andrew picked up the phone and called 911 and set the receiver back down so that police would come to the house and find his parents' bodies. Sarah Wamsley also suspected her brother of murdering her parents before the DNA evidence was even back. So she already knew something was wrong with Andrew. She must have because she filed a motion with the court to prevent Andrew from receiving his inheritance and the insurance money because she felt that he murdered her parents. She also thinks that Andrew may have tried to kill her before. They did grant her a restraining order. When Suzanne Toledano was taken into custody, she started talking immediately. She told detectives about the IHOP manager giving them the gun and basically claimed that Andrew and Chelsea made her shoot at the car and made her help murder his parents. How do you make someone? You can't. I mean, we all have free will, you know? Unless she was honestly held by gunpoint, I don't think you can really make someone do something. Right. Like, I don't know, call the police, um, you know, Yeah. report that. But here is what really gets me about this case. Suzanne Toledano, Chelsea's roommate, pled guilty to avoid the death penalty and got life with the possibility of parole after 30 years. She will be eligible for parole in 2034. Chelsea Richardson went to trial, and after three hours of deliberation, the jury found her guilty of capital murder. They felt that she's a danger to society. She was the first female sentenced to death in Tarrant County, Texas. But Andrew was convicted of capital murder, but not found to be a danger to society. He was sentenced to life. Andrew will be eligible for parole in 2044. I just feel that this is so strange. Like if Chelsea Richardson is a danger to society, I'm not sure why Andrew is not. And someone like one of his cellmates in prison or just somebody in prison claims that he actually tried to take a hit out on his sister from prison. But it was determined that Andrew is not a danger to society and he was not given the death penalty, but Chelsea, his girlfriend, was. I just feel that that is so weird. I just, I don't feel it's right. I feel that it doesn't belong. I feel like they should have received the same sentence or Andrew's should have been worse because whom he killed was his parents that he he should have loved, you know? Yeah. To her, they weren't anyone, right? But, yeah. you know, his crime was worse. Doesn't make any sense to me. The IHOP manager, Hilario Cardenas, received a 50-year sentence for conspiracy to murder. He was determined to have not been at the scene not have assisted in the actual murders. I mean, he did assist in the murders because he provided the weapon, right? Mm -hmm. But he was not there when the actual murders occurred. 
Now, I saw this and I was like, 50 year sentence? Like, he got more than anyone else here. Like, that's totally crazy to me. But I did also see that he was eligible for parole in 2014. So maybe his sentence was longer, but, you know, his actual time served would be shorter because, you know, he was eligible for parole a lot sooner. I mean, that would that would make sense, you know. And that's how Andrew Wamsley killed his parents for money he will never see. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Make sure you tune in again in two weeks to hear our next episode. Stay safe and remember, evil people are everywhere. Bye. Bye.